Good afternoon. Welcome at the EDA, the Design Media Arts Department at UCLA. Um, I'm Henry Lucas. I'm the chair of the department. Um, today, we're going to listen to a lecture by Andrew Blaufeld, who is one of the curators uh, of the graphic design now in production show that opened last Thursday in The Hammer. Um, the show is capturing where graphic design is right now, and it immediately, of course, um, raises the question where it takes us in the future. So Andrew will do uh, a lecture, um, and he will be introduced by Lorraine Wilde. Um, he will talk, and then there might be a short time for Q&A. After that, um, there will be a panel discussion for um, primarily grad students. So I think we have grad students of Otis, um, CalArts, Art Center, and uh, UCLA, the Design Media Art Students, and Information Studies. Um, and it would have not happened with the joint effort of all these departments. So I'm kind of excited to have a representation of uh, uh, a few of the most important art schools in LA. Um, so there probably will be a lot of bachelor's stu uh, BFA students here to listen to Andrew. Uh, we're going to rearrange the space a bit for the panel discussion, uh, but it's primarily for a, a, an intimate, smaller group. Um, Yes, so that leads me to introduce Lorraine Wilde, who hardly needs introduction, one of the uh, major book designers in the US and uh, a professor at CalArts. Um, uh, I wanted to thank the group that organized this event for inviting me to introduce Andrew. Um, I did want to acknowledge that this is a really rare occasion, a sort of gathering of the tribes in Los Angeles of the different schools. So um, it's a really lovely uh, thing to have happen and I guess one of, if it goes well today, it does raise the question of why don't we do this more often. <laughs> Um, I'm going to try to make this short, but of course it never seems good when you start by quoting somebody else. Um, I want to write, read a little passage from Rob Giampietro's essay in the book, um, in the graphic design catalog produced for, that, for the show that's now at the Hammer. It's from an essay on design education, and he writes, design remains even today in the peculiar position of having its history and criticism written largely by and for its own practitioners. Now, it's easy to sort of skip over that sentence, um, but it really does say something profound because when you think about it, um, although there have always been practitioners who write, you know, most artists are not writing the history of contemporary art. Most dancers aren't writing the history of contemporary dance. Or maybe history isn't even the right word, but I would say a kind of witnessing or a description that's both useful in the present to reflect upon present practice and then to help you understand both the past, where you came from, and then how, how it might go forward. But it is a fact that graphic design, for a whole set of reasons that we could eat up the rest of the afternoon talking about, has been basically kind of either bypassed or not quite recognized. And although it's not quite the way it used to be, like if you go on Design Observer and you hit in the archive section the authors, there are a whole ton of people writing about design now who are not designers. But graphic design and the specifics of it um, still, still seems um, in the purview of graphic designers' responsibility to write and describe. And I have to say that it's um, something that I noticed right away when I was a student. And in fact, I was one of those people who started writing because about graphic design because it seemed like nobody else would. 
And when I did that, um, I thought it wasn't really sustainable. I figured by now, and you know, I'm like a generation older than you guys, I thought by now that the whole discussion and description of graphic design would be in the hands of cultural theorists and historians and other people, and that we graphic designers just, just do the work and, you know. But other than the fact that Stephen Heller had written about 80 books by then, um, it, didn't, it just didn't seem sustainable that graphic designers would have to do that. But lo and behold, that is still the situation that we are um, facing, and uh, Rob G.M. Pietro's description is adequate. Um, Andrew Blauvelt today here um, is one of the people who has contributed so much to this body of writing by graphic designers, really, I think, the most important writer in the United States. Uh, on the subject, and but it is definitely coming from the inside. And for those of you younger students, I want you to understand the context of that voice coming internally. And so while you see, can walk over to the hammer and see this vast array of work, it comes out of literally 20 years of Andrews working within the, from the point of being both a practitioner and an observer of design and a very salient one at that. Um, I wanted to just kind of pick two things as I just did a quick perusal after I got called last night and asked to introduce him. Um, I found an essay that he wrote in um, 1994 called In and, Ar In and Around Cultures of Design and the Design of Cultures, which was published in the Emigre. Actually, you can find it online in, on the Emigre website. He noted, the graphic designer shares a similar dilemma of being both instrumental in the making of cultural artifacts and living in the society through which they are distributed. Their, his description in that essay is the kind of conflict, although the conflict and also the source of so much power that designers have in both being participants in their culture and then designing for it. And in that essay, he really talked or addressed the issue of the kind of oncoming diversification of who became a de graphic designer and what kind of audiences were served. Um, then later on, so that's 98, and then, I'm sorry, 1994, and then in 2008, in an essay called Towards Relational Design, he describes, in relational design, the role of the designer is closer to that of an editor or programmer not an author, but an enabler. It prefers pragmatism over post-structuralism, Dewey over Derrida, and the prosaic and banal over exotic vernaculars. It is governed by social logic and the network culture of the many to the authorial culture of one. I think those two descriptions, the earlier one of the diversification of who became designers and who they were designing for, and the later one, four years ago, in relational design, literally outline the work that is over in the hammer that displays almost um, what I know some people find a bewildering you know, diversity of work, but in fact could literally be traced from the internal point of practice. I haven't told you the general stuff about Andrew. He, <laughs> he is currently the design director at the Walker, where he's had that position since 1998. Uh, he's, uh, actually, Andrew, I forgot my phone, so I don't have the exact title, but it's like head of community. It's everything having to do with public communication and education at the Walker. So he grew that from the more traditionally defined position of essentially being the head of design within their storied design department there. Before that, he taught at North Carolina State University with Meredith Davis, another person who's looked very deeply at design education. They were both involved in writing, uh, starting to write about design education in the mid-90s. So Andrew comes to us with tremendous depth in the subject, and it's a great privilege to have him here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I told some of the other faculty that I was only ever allowed on the extension campus, so <laughs> now I'm 
<laughs> now, now, now I'm allowed in DMA. So that's uh, quite an accomplishment for me. Uh, thank you for um, taking the time out today to come to the, hear the talk. Um, and I'd like to thank Louise Sandhaus, who was instrumental um, in suggesting that we use the opportunity for the exhibition, to, since it's here in Los Angeles, to have a kind of meeting of the minds around graphic design. Um, and, and so I'm very pleased, um, given you know what the Hammer is doing with its educational programming, but to be able to have the schools come together because um, Los Angeles is um, its own ep educational epicenter, I think, for graphic design in the United States. It's really not rivaled by any other metro area that I can think of, not even New York. So um, that's quite an accomplishment, an array of people and talent here. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you um, kind of for lack of better words, a kind of tour through the exhibition, um, but it's really a tour of ideas because this is the first time that I've been able to really think about the show after having assembled it. Um, that's why it's called an afterword. It opened at the Walker about a year ago in October of 2011, and it was co-curated with Ellen Lupton, who's the curator of contemporary design at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in New York, and who's the head of uh, the graphic, well, the head of the graduate program in graphic design at MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. Um, and we had, um, and we also had some helpers along the way, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but um, the reason that we were interested in doing it is because of our own histories, our institutional and personal histories. Um, the show that um, I think Lorraine mentioned was um, called Graphic Design in America, Visual Language History, which opened at the Walker Art Center in 1989. Um, this was the first major museum exhibition about graphic design in its totality. Um, many museums, such as MoMA, have mounted sh exhibitions about posters, for example. And posters are quite a common motif for museums when they do tackle graphic design to show those, um, mostly because they're big, flat, and colorful, and they kind of resemble paintings when you put them on the wall. So um, <laughs> it feels safe. Um, and then uh, Mixing Messages was a show um, that Ellen Lupton actually curated in 1996. Um, at the Cooper Hewitt um, when she moved um, there um, for the reopening of that museum. And actually, a little known fact is that Ellen, Lorraine was involved in the Graphic Design America book um, and show, and so was Ellen Lupton. And I joke that she must have been six or something when she was <laughs> working on that show with her husband, Abbott Miller. Um, but um, Ellen's show in 1996 was called Mixing Messages, and the, real, the difference, the core essence, if I had to like crudely describe these two shows, the Graphic Design America show happened in the 1980s, which was a period in which graphic designers were really looking at their own history as a, almost a way of validating the professional practice. Like, where did we come from? What was our previous identity? And this was a story that was woven together by that exhibition that was largely historical, but also included contemporary artifacts in it, so all the way up to 1989. Um, Ellen Lupton's exhibition, on the other hand, was looking at graphic design almost as a cultural phenomenon, looking at what back then we kind of referred to as vernacular references or how graphic design operated in the world at large, not necessarily just by pra professional practitioners, but also um, street artists or other people using that kind of um, tapping into the language. So a kind of high and low analysis of graphic design. And since both institutions had been involved in that, we thought it would be interesting to, for both museums to come together to do another survey of graphic design in this time in 2011. So um, one of the things that makes the exhibition organization a little bit different is that um, it wasn't just um, Ellen and myself, it was also included um, Brioni um, Gomez Palacio and Armand Witt, who um, operated um, under consideration the website and then now operate brand new, another website and actually kind of a whole enterprise. Um, it also included Jeremy Leslie, who's um, an editorial magazine consultant out of London, who operates the blog called magculture.com. So it's kind of a clearinghouse for all the new um, mainstream and especially niche publications that are introduced worldwide each year. And lastly, Ian Albinson, who operates the blog Art of the Title, who curated the section on motion graphics for the exhibition. And I think <clears throat> this represents something of the shift that had taken place. The previous shows were basically tapping into academics and other people th writing about and thinking about graphic design. Um, but this time around, what was interesting, and it wasn't um, 
intentional on our part, but we really drew upon this, the blogosphere, basically, the idea of the amateur expert, that there's always somebody out there, like Ian, who's going to know more than I ever will about film titles or motion graphics, for example, or Jeremy Leslie is going to know more about what's happening in the world of magazine, and especially niche magazine production. So this is the catalog that was produced for the show. So this is my uh, cheap uh, sales pitch for you. <laughs> you can buy it either at the Hammer or you can, you know, where to get it cheaper. Let's look at that. But you should support the museum. They brought graphic design here. Um, and uh, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about um, pulling some of the major themes of the exhibition out. Um, kind of a little bit of theory and history, but it won't be that boring, hopefully. Um, the catalog itself um, was modeled after the last, um, well, not the last, but the whole Earth catalog that was introduced in the 1960s, um, which was kind of a resource guide to alternative culture and living, a kind of uh, hippie Bible, counterculture lifestyle Bible. Um, this is, of course, pre-internet, so this was the um, kind of the, the counterculture equivalent to the Sears catalog of how do you find your inflatable uh, structure, or where do you get your geodesic dome, or how do you make one, and how do you put it together. So, um, But what was interesting, which I don't know if you can see it or not, but the subtitle to the, to the enterprise the, was called Access to Tools. And it was that notion of, of, of graphic design as a kind of tool is where we kind of started in terms of shaping a kind of curatorial thesis. It should be um, kind of obvious that to do a show on graphic design is quite a difficult task because it is so um, ubiquitous on the one hand and so differentiated on another. And we'll get back to that in a moment. So we're uh, uh, one minute of theory here. Um, <laughs> Um, we, we, uh, Ellen and I were interested in the, the um, for lack of better words, the path not taken in the 1980s. The 1980s were a particularly fervent period for graphic designers, searching also for their own identity, but also for their own agency within the practice. In other words, not thinking of them some simply as commercial artists there to simply produce whatever they were told to produce, but rather looking for some kind of freedom and agency within that um, professionalized description in order to expand and do basically interesting work, what everyone tries to do. Um, and at the time, there were two, um, and well, in my theory, <laughs> there, are, there are two basic contenders to this. Um, Roland Bard, who's sitting there with his hand on his head, a uh, French philosopher and writer, um, from, um, who published an essay in 1968 called The Death of the Author. And on the right is um, Walter Benjamin, who published this essay, The Author as Producer, in 1934. And if you were in school in art or culture or theory in the 1970s and 1980s, um, it was largely dominated by the discourse of French post-structuralist thinkers and writers such as Bard or Derrida or Foucault. Um, and this is what dominated the discussion, this idea of authorship. But it was ironically claimed by graphic designers who were searching for these forms of agency as a way of, of, of regaining um, control over content, which would then lead to a kind of form. So if you follow that philosophy and design of form follows function, and graphic design's equivalent of that is that the form emanates from the content, right? So you're, it's not just simply random. It's something that can be pulled out of this level of content. Um, Benjamin's analysis was the path not taken, though. Um, and this is what Ellen Lupton um, wrote about in 1998. Um, this is a spread from our catalog where we pre reproduced some of these more obscure essays. And she wrote an essay called The Designer as Producer. And she argues in that essay that um, what Benjamin would really be the heir to what was going to happen and what actually did happen in since 98, which is that looking, uh, designers taking control of the tools and technology and literally the means of production, the kind of classic Marxist concept that if you have um, access and control over the tools, then you can also have um, access to distribution and other forms, other mechanisms. And it wasn't really about claiming authorship, which was in itself a kind of romantic notion um, from basically the Enlightenment forward. 
Um, but this essay was rather obscure, I think, because it was only published in an anthology of Stephen Heller's collected writings about education. And it was actually a new essay. So like, for example, I never even read it because I just assumed I had read all this material in this book anyway, but I got the book for a reference manual, but um, only discovered it actually just about two years ago. Um, but it was actually picked up in Europe, which is another footnote that we can follow later. Um, <coughs> But this notion of authorship and designers wanting to control the kind of the destiny of their work and the choices that they have um, was written about by Michael Rock, who's another one of these practitioners. He's the found, one of the co-founders of Two by Four, a design studio in New York, and was a prolific writer before kind of entering practice full time. And he had written an essay in I Magazine um, called, uh, which they had titled The Designer as Author. Um, which then kind of cemented this whole notion that if designers could become authors and then control their work, um, that they would have more agency. But of course, actually, Michael in that essay was actually arguing almost the opposite. And he got quite frustrated that everyone kept referring to him, that he kind of started this whole idea. So he wrote in his, his rejoinder many years later called Fuck Content. Um, which he was basically putting forward a kind of really typical modernist uh, notion about um, the role of form that r form plays and that as a designer it's not really um, as a professional designer practicing designer people will come to you with all sorts of content and problems and those are really out of your control but what you have control over is the form that you give them right the, the, your response to it and so it's, it's a very sort of classic modernist take kind of shocking actually at the time but or still but this played along well with um, other modernist tropes. Um, this one from Joseph Mueller Brockman, the famous Swiss modernist, <laughs> from his book, The Graphic Artist, and his design problems, which I kind of love that title now. <laughs> it's not the graphic designer, of course, right? And so it almost feels like really contemporary. Um, some other important um, kind of anecdotes and writings along the way were this essay by Daniel van der Velden who, of Meta Haven um, called Research and Destroy in which he's arguing about the role that designers can play. Um, he's looking really at the modern notion of designer as a kind of laborer in the contemporary sort of um, late capitalist system of producing, producing work and, and a concept called immaterial, cult uh, immaterial labor kind of an ironic name. It's a way that in the classic Marxist sense, laborers were really the physical manual working and manufacturing. But in our new economy, um, information workers like designers play an important role in that, important, play an important part of that. And he's basically um, putting forward this kind of um, more provocative um, challenge to designers to kind of um, stop working on problems and kind of reinvent themselves, basically. And then lastly, there's many others, but um, this is essay by James Goggin, who is now the design director at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, but is based in London for many years, <coughs> um, wrote this essay about graphic design. And um, what's the kind of bottom line takeaway of this is that um, graphic design is intrinsically heterogeneous in its practices, meaning that it really can't be defined by any one tool or technology or format or genre. Um, that it becomes um, really, the definition of it is really the plurality of all of those forms of design, graphic design in particular. Okay. Um, you may not have heard, but. <laughs> um, this is Neville Brody. Um, he assumed the directorship of the Royal College of Art. Um, design, graphic design program. They don't call it graphic design, actually. but. Um, uh, I think his larger point that the, the traditional notion of graphic design is dead. So um, <clears throat> if you have any experience at all in the field, you'll understand that it's actually quite splintered. And there are many different forms, and sometimes people do many things. Um, like Lorraine is typically identified as a book designer, but of course she does other things. Um, there's editorial designers, so there's these conventional things like package designers or exhibition designers, and there's newfangled things like experience designers or app designers or web designers or information designers or data visualists um, or visual journalists is another one. Um, but that gives you, and this is like just a simple truncated list, 
Um, but it gives you the, it kind of illustrates the problem of like beginning to define what exactly a graphic designer is. And then in the larger type, there are some other po appropriate, uh, appropriated possibilities for what a designer might be as an author, a kind of author, a kind of editor, perhaps a producer in the larger sense, kind of an orchestrator of things. Um, some of the newer tropes, design as curator, which I guess I fall into, but, but I'm too professional, so I don't really count in that group. But um, entrepreneur, kind of designer as entrepreneur, or designer as researcher. I know Ed's here today, so I just want <laughs> to make a reference to this. Um, so I love this. This is, um, I hope this is right, because he's in the audience, but I th believe this is the moving announcement for Schizomarceration, which was an ad agency in Detroit in around 1975. But he um, shows this in his lectures, and I love his line, um, the only thing left is coffee. So if you're old enough to remember all the tools of the trade that define the graphic design desktop, um, you can't have you can't have cigarettes even anymore. And there's certainly no phone like that, so you can only have coffee. Um, this has always been kind of the third rail. Like when I was in school, we never talked about tools or technologies or equipment because that made you seem like you're a vocational kind of study person. Um, like you literally wouldn't be interested in printing presses or things like that because design was more of the cerebral, conceptual, and formal execution of a problem, solving of a problem. But of course technology plagues graphic design. It can't escape from it. And so in some ways the show picks up the remnants of a field that had been obliterated by, in 1984 by the introduction of the Macintosh computer by Apple and in 1994 by the commercialization of the internet and the Netscape um, uh, Navigator browser. And I, I threw this in for the older folk. <laughs> this was the typical, I have to read the description. Uh, desktop publishing setup circa 1988, Apple Macintosh computer 21 inch radius monitor, Apple laser writer and microtech scanner. This was literally my equipment, but this wasn't my photograph. I just found this on the internet, but it gives you some idea of the um, state of the affair. But this was the great promise, right? This would be the great liberator, um, that, th that the, the Macintosh computer became the synthesizing agent, the, the creative tool, the uber tool by which um, you don't have to have a typewriter anymore to generate text. You don't need a photostat machine to make copies. You don't need exacto knives to cut things out. That all of this, all of these techniques, you could set your own type. All of this could be poured into the machine. And so the promise of desktop publishing, ironically, never happened until recently, when desktop publishing hooked up with um, more uh, web-based platforms like print-on-demand. So I'll just go through a, several of these kinds of tropes that hopefully might be either interesting. I should point out that the show itself is kind of a cacophonous arrangement of more than 500 projects. And so what I've done here is remix everything in terms of pulling out. It's done by genre. So there's a section on posters, a section on typography, a section on information design, et cetera. There's about seven sections like this, which are the typical forms and genres of graphic design. Um, but what I did here was remix some of the projects together in order to pull out some themes that I think are at least motivated or interesting, perhaps interesting still. So one of these is from desktop publishing to self-publishing, or from giving the tools of authorship to systems of distribution. So one of the most, probably the most influential design periodical, in quotes, um, during this time was dot, 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 which started in 2000 and lasted until 2010. And, um, it's uh, created by Stuart Bailey and um, Peter Belock, and then later joined by David Reinfurt. Um, <clears throat> there was actually a fourth contributor to the original, but I, his name escapes me now, Jürgen, I think. He's a German designer. Um, but this was really a magazine of visual culture created by graphic designers using graphic design, but it can't really be described as a traditional graphic design magazine, right? And this would become a theme later, where graphic design really is simply a kind of medium, a method, a technology, a tool, but it's not the final product. And this is really a, a, a provocation by this generation of designers to say, 
uh, those old people like me um, in the 80s were too much focused on the notion of, of consolidating a lot of um, legitimacy around graphic design, almost graphic design for graphic design's sake, where the most interesting things in the world at large were always beyond that. Um, uh, Tim Moore, who's based in Portland, this is Letter to Jane, which started, of course, as a blog, like many things did earlier in the 2000s. Um, and this is the iPad edition. And probably the most extreme example of self-publishing, um, this is a set of books, cookbooks, um, called Modernist Cuisine by Nathan Marivold, who was a a millionaire from Microsoft ranks, um, who developed a passion for cooking and technique. Um, it's six volumes, actually. There's one that's not part of the box. Um, it's 2,438 pages, and it weighs 52 pounds. Uh, the team that produced it included 50 staff members and contributing experts, four outside experts, 36 researchers, and cost approximately $1 million. It was produced in a set of, of 6,000 copies. Um, this is a project by Winterhouse Studios, the people who run Design Observer. This was um, produced on the occasion, uh, if you can remember back that far, this was um, what would become known as the Bush Doctrine in terms of changing American foreign policy. And um, what Winterhouse did was simply download the document available from .gov, the White House .gov, and um, simply printed it up and circulated it in bookstores on the East Coast. And that was in response to the media's lack of attention being paid to um, what was really the, philosophy, the shift in philosophy, um, and that really wasn't getting much discussion, if any, in the mainstream press. If designers could be authors and designers of their own books, then they certainly would lead them to become publishers. And this is the case with Adam Michaels and Project Projects based in New York. This is their new imprint, Inventory Books, and which started in 2010. Um, these are, of course, large-scale dummies. The books are very tiny books, actually printed um, rather cheaply at a, a Brooklyn um, printer. So black and white, very raw on the inside. Or Gerlinda Schiller, who, um, um, who began her career working for Irma Boom and now has an information design studio in Amsterdam, created this book for Lars Mueller, who is himself a graphic designer turned publisher in Switzerland. Um, so it's actually a kind of an encyclopedia of data and information design um, facts. Or Meta Haven, as mentioned earlier, this is their book on corporate identity, also for, for Lars Mueller, but designed and written by them, edited by them which explores their research-based practice in um, identities, most famously the Principality of Sealand project that they um, started at the Jan van Eyck Academy in the Netherlands. So Christian Mindersma, um, she was the product designer from Eindhoven, um, working with uh, Julie Juliat um, who, to create the book design. Um, this was her thesis project at the Academy. Um, the book's called Pig 05049. It follows the life of one pig and its modern processing. Um, <coughs> she had the idea to try to prove or disprove the notion that in today's society we waste too much, and that in the old days it was thought that the pig would be fully used. Um, they used to have this joke in the South, like everything but the squeal. So you could really eat everything, <laughs> package everything. So what she did was she followed one pig and how it was processed and used in different industries. So it's quite fascinating. And the conclusion was actually that today's pig is more thoroughly utilized than the kind of nostalgic pig <laughs> that we think about. Um, logo RIP by the Stone Twins in the Netherlands. This is one of the first projects to look at um, the aftermath of corporate branding and identity. In this case, um, so these are all the kind of dead identities, um, a kind of um, historic preservation movement of sorts for graphic design. We've heard about it for architecture and buildings, of course. But again, an independent research project produced. Other mechanisms for self-publishing, Sky Kraus, probably more famously for the older people in the room as the inventor of Kai's power tools, um, now a recluse in Germany. But uh, one of his um, causes is um, illiteracy and geography, kind of geographic illiteracy, I guess. Um, he calls it immapancy. 
kind of like illiteracy. This is uh, called The True Size of Africa, and this was simply re released as a tweet pic in 2010. So it's com a Creative Commons licensing, so it's fully available for distribution and circulation without permission. <coughs> This is a project that's actually inside the catalog. It's by the uh, London-based collective Albaca um, called I Am Still Alive. It's an ongoing series of projects. This is issue number 21. Um, they vary in terms of content, design, and style, but what binds it together is actually the mode of distribution, and they call this a parasite publication, meaning that it resides within another, um, it always resides within another magazine, typically a magazine. In this case, it was our catalog. But the technology is a print on demand, of course. Um, this is a project by James Goggin, students in Germany, um, called Dear, and then fill in the blank, Dear Lulu, Dear Blurb, Dear Colophon. So this is a calibration test book that was sent to these various print on demand um, publishers to see what the tolerances would be like in technology, fidelity. Within the rise of self-publishing, of course, is the risograph. Um, <clears throat> these are um, high-speed digital duplicators, most often used by megachurches, actually, in the U.S. <laughs> when, you need, when you just happen to need 10,000 copies of the hymnal <laughs> and don't, don't want to go to Kinko's. Um, so this is, um, but it's been appropriated by designers, and it uses uh, basic color toner cartridges. So this one, um, actually on the right, is a project by Erzlani from Rillo Press called, um, this is Ken Isaac's classic book, How to Build Your Own Living Structures. This is the revisited edition from 2009 in monochromatic blue. Not available for purchase, of course, because of copyright, but available via exchange. Um, print on demand is also a technology being used by a lot of um, poster printers now in the commercial sense. So you can, you know, of course, um, you don't have to print a lot of extra copies, you don't have to store them, so you, a lot of museums, if you go into their shops and look at the posters, a lot of museums are using the same kind of technology, so you simply order it up and it ships to you. Um, this is a designer in Vienna, Albert Exerzian. This is iconic TV poster series from 2009 and 10. And you get to figure out all the references. This is a mashup of sort of American popular culture and Swiss style poster graphics. But the same technology is now being used um, for other kinds of products. These are three um, separate designs, actually, um, for a series of custom digital wallpaper by Maharam. And these are all by designer, uh, well, mostly, well, designers, designers, artists. Um, Karl Martens from the Netherlands for Dutch Clouds. And City of Words is a Vito Conche, a Conche studio. He's an artist and designer. And then um, the last one is, um, flyer from uh, Cyan, a design studio in Germany. So another theme I think that floats through the show is this idea from fixed genres to hybrid media. Um, geographic design, like I said, has been kind of constructed around these commonplace genres like posters, books, et cetera, which the show itself partakes in. But there's a lot of things that are harder to classify now, partly because of what they are. Um, Philippe Apolloy, this is a La Lorraine typeface, has static and motion variations uh, from 2005. There's actually a video in the show, which is quite good to see, about how he's working on both the X and the Y axis. So it's, how do you, you know, so basically the problem here is how do you begin to think about issues of typography in motion? Or this is an interesting one that crosses media. If you've, did you see the film, An Inconvenient Truth? <laughs> <laughs> by Al Gore, which started as a PowerPoint, right? So it went from PowerPoint to movie, and then became a book, and the book is in the background, and that's um, designed by management in New York. And then it became an e-book and kind of expanded its content with something called Our Choice by Melcher Media. This is one of the first kind of more elaborate e-books published um, in, 20, in 20, late 2010, 2011, with interactive diagrams and video embedded in the, in the, in the book. This is a project from uh, Catalog Tree from the Netherlands called Speed and Money Inside the Black Box. It was a, it's an iPad application that was developed in conjunction with a, a documentary for Dutch television on the American flash crash and the financial markets in 2010, I believe. 
Um, this project's from 2011, and Catalog Tree did the data visualization. This is um, when the, this, the flash crash, which you may not have heard about because it happened so quickly, was the fastest drop in the U.S. stock market and it recovered within 20 minutes, but it was the sharpest decline. People think largely because of electronic trading practices and their lack of regulation, I should say. Um, but also the um, kind of appropriation of other kinds of genres. Um, this is uh, E, which is a... Or, uh, I does. <laughs> um, this is a newspaper actually in Portugal. And what's interesting about it is a lot of newspapers have been suffering, you know, loss of sales and revenues. Um, they have simply appropriated a kind of magazine format, but it's still printed on newsprint, but it's bound and stitched, which apparently will drive your revenue up. <laughs> so it's an interesting factoid for the world of newspapers. Or this classic. Um, this is stuff that started on the internet, of course, becomes then printed. Um, this is by Ben Terrett. Um, things our friends have written on the internet in 2008. Um, this was interesting because this is um, published, it's web printed, um, but it's, it uses a service called Newspaper Club in London. It's a time sharing service for pr printing presses. So a lot of newspapers um, print at a specific time of day, whether they're a morning edition or an evening edition. And um, otherwise the press is set idle. And so instead of just simply sitting idle, they will sell bits of time. So you can buy into these blocks of time and they'll produce your stuff for a lot cheaper. If in the 80s and 90s we had authorship and occasionally auteurship, this idea of the designer as a kind of um, personal style, something we would hire um, because of that look, um, to this idea of the designer as entrepreneur, I think this can be seen um, probably most strongly in um, Yelp van Bennekon, um, who's the creative director, editorial director of a couple of magazines. Um, most recently, Fantastic Man, two fashion magazines, quote unquote fashion magazines, and The Gentlewoman. And he started his uh, career, uh, his studies as graphic designer, but then became more involved in actually um, commissioning writing, commissioning photography, and then creating and launching these own, these own rather successful publications. Um, Aaron Draplin and Codell Partners for Field Notes. This is the do-it-yourself with press type, if you remember what press type is. It's from 2011. Experimental Jet Set. So um, this is, a, of course, the Beatles t-shirt, famous design from 2001 that was appropriated as a kind of meme around the internet. Um, in which they document all the versions of, uh, on their website, if you're interested, in an article called T-shirtism. But this gets at the notion that this is quite simple, I think, in American culture <laughs> in particular, that um, a lot of graphic designers become sort of brand strategists. And, um, and so when a client comes to you from a business perspective, especially small businesses, they often need a lot of extra help in terms of things like brand positioning, market positioning, product development, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of designers have gotten quite good at being able to make quite a success for their clients. And so a lot of designers, graphic designers in particular, have thought, well, shit, why don't I just do this for myself, right? Because I'm, I'm a creative person, I have ideas, I have concepts, and I know how to get everything out in the world, so why don't I just do it myself? So this is a lot of what you're starting to see now, I think. This is Peter Buchanan Smith, who operates as a graphic designer, but also has started his own company called Best Made in New York, which he does um, these bespoke axes, so you can have custom painted patterns, but it's all about craft and quality. Um, it's part of the artisanal culture making that's happening right now, but at a very high level. You can have a $400 ax. Um, and Mike Perry, and this is kind of the graphic design as kind of surface culture, sort of gra uh, graphic culture at writ large, where design and illustration can appear on, almost on any surface. And Daniel Velderven, Van der Velden has an interesting take on this, and that's like, in, in theory and history, architects are described as being the producers of space, right? So they, but his uh, take is that the graphic designers are the producers of surfaces. And like, it's so much more, pro, um, there are so many more surfaces than there are buildings, for example, in the world. And that this is really where a lot of the action will be in the future. 
And then extending this line of entrepreneurship back to the show itself, I think is Armin Witt and Brioni Gomez Palacio's website, which is really more than just a website. This is brand new. This is a website that features new releases for corporate makeovers, largely corporate, but also cultural identity makeovers. And what I think is interesting is that you now have the first generation of people who are sort of like became famous on the internet. You used to have to become famous in magazines, but now there are a string of people who have become famous essentially on the internet who are leveraging these platforms. So now they have conferences and competitions, and they have their own audience of graphic designers. Um, another theme or being through the show is that from the analog to the algorithm, and I'm, what I'm calling descendant media, because we have always have emergent media, but we never have descendant media, so I thought we should have descendant media now. And um, here we have Ed <laughs> Fellow, who uses uh, cut and paste and serography to produce these. This is uh, for Laola Marmount, 2009, the front and back of a poster that's created for, as a kind of souvenir after the talk. So again, interesting. Um, uh, functional issue or traditional functional issue. It's not really used to promote the show, but rather as a souvenir after the show, after the fact. Um, Christoph Spetschel, who's um, originally from Belgium but now lives in the United Kingdom, he's known as the Lord of the Dark Lord of the of the logo, and <laughs> he's he's created about well more than. 700 now, probably 800 or 900 um, death metal band logos. <laughs> so. So you thought all of this came from LA, but no. <laughs> well, it might have actually in a whole nother disguise, but we could talk about that later. <laughs> um, and, oh, I'm sorry, those were all hand drawn, so he doesn't use the computer at all. These are all pencil drawn and then filled in with ink. Um, Graham Rawl, uh, this is a book called Woman's World from 2005. It's 400 pages long. And the text was written from um, typography clipped from about a thousand different women's magazines of the early 1960s. Uh, Jonathan Saffron Foyer um, for Visual Editions. It's an imprint set up by two graphic designers in London um, to really push forward the notion of the. I don't want to say the graphic novel because that gives you a different thing in your head about illustration. This is really about how do you push graphic design to become like almost like a visual book. And so they're very much interested in producing like these largely visual books. And um, the author, in this case, um, carved out, again, removing uh, from um, Bruno Schultz's Street of Crocodiles to create a new text called Tree of Codes. And there's a nice video on YouTube for the creation of this. I think at Takura, <laughs> those of you know. So this is all, um, this is a little inset video clip of all the pieces falling through. So it's a you know, rather a complex project. Uh, Marian Banshees, this is Design Ignites Change poster from 2008. This is laser cut, so no printing at all, laser cut paper. And of course, the older technologies like silkscreen, this is um, aesthetic apparatus who kind of rejuvenated the gig music poster in the Midwest. And um, this is the installation view from the Walker show in the last fall. So these are all the make readies from those series of uh, prints that they sell in limited editions. Um, Anthony Burrell, uh, Oil and Water Do Not Mix. This is a commissioned piece um, using, it's a silkscreen print using oil scavenged from the Gulf of Mexico spill. or more typical of the series of this genre, work hard and be nice to people, poster. <laughs> From 2008, this is uh, printed in his local village um, on letterpress. So the resurgence of letterpress. David Pearson for Penguin, a series of letterpress um, book covers for classic text. So quite beautiful, especially all together. Um, and then, so at the same time you have the analog, you also have this idea of automation happening and scripting and algorithms. Um, this is Rick Valicenti, the Chicago designer, and John um, Pawlowski, um, called Intelligent Design. And what it is, is they wrote a script that basically took uh, the book of Genesis and then translated it into zeros and ones. And then the zeros and ones are represented by cans of Coke Zero or 
or Coke Zero, or Pepsi, oh, sorry, Pepsi One or Coke Zero, screwed that up. Um, Mikael Sherman uh, from the Netherlands. Um, this is inspiration for all the future <laughs> graphic designers. He had a really horrible job at Amsterdam Kinko's and um, as a graphic, trained as a graphic designer, but he, in his spare time, he played around with the equipment there, especially the oversized black and white copiers. Um, and then he performs a series, he exploits the action scripts within programs like Illustrator and Photoshop to create these posters, which are for a client, actually. Or Ben Fry, this is Frankenstein. It's a print-on-demand book, which I'll screw up the description of here, but I'll try to do it. So it's the text of Frankenstein, but what he did was he hacked into the PDF, the page description format. Um, you know, the PDF, as you all should know, <laughs> encodes all the typography within it, so you don't have to send along fonts, but you can actually break all that apart. And so what he did was tapped into all of, like, the 10 most commonly downloaded PDFs on the internet in order to find the letters, initial letters, and then those letters go up to make the text again of Frankenstein, so there's a detail of it, and so it takes on this very Frankenstein-like quality. And this is in the exhibition at the Hammer, uh, less poster wall for the 21st century. This is a, an algorithm. So um, what it is is the uh, machines are given uh, URLs, um, or text and image-based URLs, so like news sites or other kinds of feeds. It scrapes the text and the data, uh, the images from that, and the computer creates a design composition. You can also, it also has motion sensors in it, so you can activate the screen. But um, it generates a QR code, a unique uh, QR code, and then you can use your phone to capture it, so you can have it for yourself later. You can also tweet to it, and it will create headlines based on your tweets. But again, a very 21st century notion of the old poster wall. And then also in the exhibition is this project by Soso Limited um, called Set, Set Top Box from 2010. And this is a uh, real-time generated uh, information display. Um, there's a television set that is, um, where its feed is the soap opera channel. So it's 24 hours of straight soap operas. Um, and what it's doing is basically it's parsing the text from closed captioning. And so it's, it's using that text stream in order to analyze the use of language within it. So it ties into another database that is based around artificial intelligence. So it tries to sense emotion and other kinds of properties on that text. And then it renders out in these sort of three-dimensional typographic blocks in real time that text. Um, there's, there was, we go from sort of the mastery of tools, which is sort of the classic definition of graphic design, to the making of tools. And this is in a really important transformation, I think, that's happening within the field. And it shifts the definition of design away from individual and lone artifacts to the creation of tools, systems, and technologies. This is Hans Rosling, um, creator of Gapminder. This is from a DVD that's in the show that you can watch called Joy of Stats. This is a holographic projection, projected version of his famous um, diagram of health statistics around the world. Or your glannies, um, this installation view from the walker of two projects, one Victor, which you can see a video of at the hammer, and um, another project called Empty Words, which I'll talk about in a moment. Jonathan Pucky, um, the creation of tools, in this case, using scriptographer. Um, this project is called Text Pencil. And so the cursor can be loaded with text, much like you would load a pen with ink. And it's moved across, you move it across the surface, so you move your cursor across the screen, across the page. Um, it deposits the words. And this is an example of its use by Luna Maurer in a book called Drawing Typologies. This is also being used in the creation of identities. So at the Walker, we created this um, custom, it's based on its appropriated font technology um, for an identity or for a typeface, quote unquote typeface called Ex Walker Expanded, which includes words instead of letters and textures that you can customize and put together from 2005. This is Stefan Sagmeister for Cossica Musica from 2007. So the shape that you're seeing is the shape of the building, which is by Rem Koolhaas and OMA. And then uh, there are different, um, you can insert a photo 
So we have a photo of Beethoven in this case. And then there's a, a set of coordinates, and it, it color picks it. So it's some, something like the eyedrop tool in Photoshop. So it's isolating colors. And those become the color palette. And that co color palette gets mapped on the surfaces, the faceted surfaces of the logo. So every day or every five minutes, you can have a new custom palette. Nicholas Felton, his sort of famous projects, which were personal annual reports tracking all of his consumption for a year, um, in which he, case, he uh, created with Ryan Case um, an app called Datum in 2008, which can track all of your consumption on your iPhone. So all of this has a, has a ready, handy database in case you want to make your own annual report later. Or Christopher Clark, this is the newest area for web-based typography. His project's called Web Typography for the Lonely. This is the triangulate kind of filter, for lack of better words. And this is a website where you can uh, type in your, your use, so kind of like on a font site where you can preview the t letter forms. Here you can actually use the whole program to make a composition with and create the effect and download it. I think lastly is a section from authorship to crowdsourcing, which of course is another major issue within the field, let's say. Um, and so it operates in both, both extremes from um, the need to become an author in the sense of classically controlling both form and content and distribution, and on the other from freeing up that, freeing yourself up from that demand. So you would have projects like um, Marion Banshee's book, I Wonder, from 2011. And again, I think Marianne's interesting because she kind of came to fame on the internet. And so as a writer, i.e. a blogger, is what the basis of her texts are. And some of them are quite good, I think. Um, Finette Maillet is a, a Paris-based graphic designer. It's a project called Bastard Battle, a book um, in which she was authorized to commission a series of writers, in this case, Celine Menard. Um, this is a book from 2008. Or the classic um, meme, the cultural meme. Uh, this is Scott Thomas who did the um, Obama identity, the one from last time around, which I think they're still using. But here, of course, um, the, the, the design can be so powerful, so intoxicating that you must carve it into pumpkins and make cookies out of it. I don't know if anyone's what they're doing now. Could be a little sadder now. Um, uh, within this idea, of course, is the idea of incompleteness or the open work. And so you would have just enough information within an existing design in order to invite some kind of contribution. This is Daniel Etock's utilitarian poster from actually 1998. Silk screen on newsprint, and what it is, it's hard to read it, but it basically breaks down all the components of a traditional ad. So your headline, the location, the date, the time, the cost, and it gives you all of these appropriate fields, and you can just write it in and post it. Or more recently, Silky and Men, identity for um, the Guggenheim, BMW Guggenheim Lab, 2011. In this case, um, the identity is made from input, so those are the so I'm sorry, um, here you can answer this question. What does comfort mean in the city to you? And then your answer becomes fed into the, into the system. And then it's constantly changing. Are your Glennie and Alex Rich, empty words. So this is at, actually at the hammer. So you can play with it there. Um, this is a, a kind of hacked vinyl cutter. Um, that in a, t a simple kind of typesetting program, so you can uh, you have a monitor, you can type in your message, and then the machine will cut it. So instead of cutting vinyl, it cuts paper, though. So you can make your own poster. And then the notion of posters itself, and like how would they be generated, and what kind of system would they live in? It's Dimitri Siegel and Edward Morris, Green Patriot Poster Series, or project from 2010. This was um, cop, um, compiled into a book, so these are 50 of the pages from the book. But what's interesting here is the idea of leveraging a platform in a digital sense in order to create and kind of expand the opportunities around, in this case, a particular social cause, environmental, global warming, and stuff that you should be more familiar with. <laughs> here, this is um, Aaron Koblen and Chris Milk's The Wilderness Downtown video. So this, um, for those of you who haven't tried it, um, you, it uses, uh, exploits 
Google Chrome web browser uh, when it was released. And then you can enter in your uh, street address. It asks you to enter your childhood street address for more traumatic effect, I think. And then um, it exploits the Google Maps and integrates them into the video narrative. So your home will be overrun by trees, kind of the reverse of social. Um, and also um, the same team for the Johnny Cash project which um, allows people to use uh, online tools to draw um, frames of the video. And then those, those drawings or those uh, paintings or photographs or whatever the manipulation is can be uploaded and become part of a continuously evolving video. Because right? you just keep adding more and more frames per second. And I'll end with this one, which is um, a similar but different project from Jonathan Pucky and Raoul Woters from the Netherlands called One Frame of Fame. And here is exploiting the technology of the, of the uh, laptop um, camera, the um, laptop cameras, yes, or cell phone cameras, any kind of internet-based camera um, for a music video in which the band members here in, uh, on the left <laughs> giving you the gesture that you can recreate, take a photo of, and upload. And then it becomes also part of the structure of the video, of the final video. Um, the version at the Hammer includes 37,000 um, user contributions to the final content. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions, I guess. Thanks. Thank you. So we have um, a short amount of time to ask Andrew some questions. Um, and who has one? Great, you're free. Um, well, the text happened secondarily. So we had uh, the show together first, so we picked works for the show, and, and then we made the catalog. So it was like two, two separate steps, but part of, it all goes to the same end point, which is the opening of the show. Um, it was just extremely hard to put around parameters around what an idea of a contemporary survey of graphic design would be like, and so we struggled for a long time about, um, should it be global? And what is, what the hell does that mean? And <laughs> um, uh, should it be in? Should it should it be called out in themes like I talked about, or should it be in something more? Because we both work for public museums, where most of our visitors are, are not graphic design students or graphic designers. So we kind of erred on the side of, of framing it in ways that which might be more familiar to them. So the posters are all the posters, although some of them are funky, like the you know uh, poster wall project or the one where you make your own. Um, so we struggled a lot with how, how, we, how would we represent this to the public, but we also knew at the same time it had to be represented to the field, the people who care the most about it. And so that's why the book kind of gives you more of the theory and the history and all the tangents and all the backstories for it. So that's kind of how we tackled it. Um, I was wondering, with the reduction of price and the globalization of all these techniques, um, how do you think that affects uh, the design culture in that everyone and anyone could make any kind of graphic design? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a problem that started happening in 1984 when the personal computer was developed. Um, but then, you know, the scale of the project, the complexity of it, the creativity of the individual, What's interesting is that um, the software f was, of course, first released, and graphic design was the first design field impacted by the computer way before architecture and product design. 
Um, and I think that's given a level of maturity around discussions <laughs> about the use of technology and the role of technology. In the old days, it was very much like, oh my God, I don't want to touch this. This is not graphic design. You know, I want to use my cut out my stuff and paste it up. So it was this kind of dialogue for a long time, but um, it quickly moved away from that and became more embracing of technology. And I think one of the biggest things is that graphic designers are partaking of their own drop in price, um, the ubiquity of service available through things like print on demand. But what makes the projects different, I hope, is that the level of creativity um, and thinking that goes into any individual project. So you know, you, it's great if you're a would-be writer and want to publish your own work. But I think the most interesting examples that I've seen are not that, but um, graphic designers who don't work in traditional ways needing to publish something that they normally wouldn't have access to just in the same way that a normal like writer wouldn't necessarily have access to the publishing industry proper. So I think price, um, a lot of designers are worried about competition in terms of what they do. There's a lot of automation and what can be done that's already prevalent in the field. So a lot of professional designers would probably answer that. Um, things like innovation, creativity, et cetera, individual kind of uh, interpretation is what really is, will be the value that you're giving, not um, how fast you can execute something, because you'll, you'll be using <laughs> laborers in China, printers in China, you know, like it's, it's a globalization of the services. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the effect of writing and its role that it's played in you being a practitioner of design? Well, that's interesting. Um, I would actually, being a teacher was more influential in being a practitioner because, um, how do you say this? Um, <laughs> If you're a good teacher, you're not art directing 30 people. Um, so you have to empower people to do their design and create an environment and context in which they can flourish. And so that's what I brought to the design studio, is that same philosophy, which is very different than I think a lot of traditional art directors and creative directors who sit there drawing sketches or something and giving it to people. Um, it's just, that just doesn't seem very interesting to me. It seems more interesting to have discussions and, and, and um, be more concerned about the ideas and the concepts, and then also, very um, detail oriented around production and you know uh, printing and very technical things as well so there's kind of this weird two extremes but I, I think actually education has more influence on my practice than writing writing is this weird thing because it takes so long and it's so torturous and then you have to design it too like I just can't process that so <laughs> I need like a year off and then I can go, although the book I kind of did together, but I had another designer working with me on it. And so we were writing and designing at the same time. And that seemed, um, uh, that seemed exciting it, or, and exhausting at the same time. Yeah. How do you think education now in graphic design is affecting the field in general and specifically and all of the things that you reflect in your um, work right now? Yeah, that's the million dollar question <laughs> of the afternoon, I think. I was gonna be provocative and say, there's no such thing as design, powerful design programs anymore, school programs, not computer programs. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I say that because, you know, uh, there's this kind of classic arc if you're in the field that certain schools come to prominence and they kind of dominate. I think they really do dominate the discourse. I don't think a lot of it is from the profession because I think the profession is very fragmented. So it's hard to put out a position that's really coherent. Whereas a school can kind of do that ideologically through the people it produces and the kinds of things that they're interested in doing. So th there's a kind of this rise and fall to various schools, but what I've noticed is that there hasn't been really a successor, and a dominant successor, I mean. There's still plenty of good schools around. But what I think is interesting, and for better or for worse, is that the internet has become its own kind of school. You know, and you see this a lot, I think. And so my provocative statement would be that there's now, that, you know, there's this, like, my joke is that there's a school of many stuff. And if you know what that is, then you know what I mean. It's like porn, you know, there's no like curatorial filter. It's just simply, oh, I think they'll like this. And sure enough, they will. And, and they'll post it. And then it becomes, and then, you, and then you go, oh, okay, that's what 
gets posted, I, I want to do something like that. It's like being in school, if I was honest. In school, we had that same kind of thing where you're like, oh, there's the upperclassmen, and they're doing that project, and oh, that's interesting response to that. I think that's the answer. Not the exact answer, but that's sort of what you should be doing. And so I guess my provocative idea is that there are really no more schools that are going to be dominant in that way, that it's, it, it, the speed at which ideas are disseminated now is so fast that as a curator, it's really hard to pinpoint, like, who started this? <laughs> and you know, like who originated it? And so I have to train, retrain myself because I'm sort of old school in that notion of original, that it doesn't really much matter anymore. And there's a line in the essay in the book that I read that I kind of, that I kind of like for myself <laughs> as a writer. <laughs> I don't consider myself like an official writer, but, um, but it was something along the lines of, um, it's not about what's trendy, it's about what's trending. And those are two different concepts, and like, and, and the kind of critical mass that's assumed around trending topics, what I would call trending topics, in graphic design is what really guides the fields, like kind of more avant-garde development now. Sure. Thank you.